Well, good evening. Thank you for joining us uh, for Good Friday. A Good Friday is for me always a, an incredible uh, night. It's an opportunity to think back on the most significant moment in all of human history. And I'm glad that this evening, though in an unusual way, we get to connect, we get to share uh, together just what that night means. I don't know if you've ever been to a passion play before. I've been to a few over the years, put on by different churches. The most famous of them is held every 10 years in Germany in the little village of Obermagau. And it has a really interesting history uh, that has a somewhat uh, unusual connection to what we're experiencing today. The history uh, tracks back to the year 1633 when the Black Plague was spreading through Europe. Uh, the little village of Obermagau had already lost 80 of its residents to this silent spreading disease. And so the villagers turned to prayer. In fact, they kind of turned to uh, an attempt to strike a deal with God. And their bargain with God was that if he would spare them any more death, if he would spare their town any more uh, the horrors of this plague, that they would pledge to perform uh, a, the story of Jesus' passion, his life, his death, his resurrection, every 10 years from then on. And uh, the story is told that God did spare that community any further loss and they have attempted to keep their word as a community. For the most part, over the past 400 years, this little village, uh, Bavarian village, has held a grand passion play uh, highlighting the story of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. Only a few exceptions along the way, like the 1920 and 1940 years, Germany was involved in the World War uh, deeply at those, those uh, seasons. But other than just a few times, they have hosted this massive production that graphically tells the story of Jesus. And it's grown to be a global tourist thing, a global tourist attraction uh, with a 2,500-member cast, up to 900 people that are on stage at the same time in this huge venue that's built uh, out of doors uh, for this entire thing to be performed. And as you might guess, 2020 is an even decade year. Uh, they were scheduled to perform the Passion Play in Obermagau this year. Um, the schedule called for 103 performances. Each of those performances, based on past experience, likely to draw uh, over 4,500 spectators that would come to this little Bavarian town and watch the Passion Play. And then, as you know, uh, COVID-19 happened. And uh, like most places, Germany is on lockdown. And so the presen presentation of Jesus' story, the presentation of the, uh, the passion of Jesus' death, uh, which first started at a plague 400 years ago, this year it get, got canceled uh, by the presence of this another invisible spreading disease. It's kind of ironic and I'm sure deeply disappointing for those that were expecting to participate or go and see that, that performance this year. But I think it's important to remember uh, that the telling of the story of Jesus' death uh, can never be canceled. As long as there are followers of Jesus Christ uh, still on this earth, the mandate that we've been given to spread the news and share the message and tell the story of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished uh, on Good Friday will be pursued. Um, maybe we do not get to gather in a building together uh, this Good Friday night and revisit the details of Jesus' death on the cross, but we can and we should uh, still tell the story with our families and on social media and through a broadcast like this. Good Friday 2020 is different. It's different, uh, but it is still an opportunity to share who Jesus is and what he did and how he has changed our lives. If you've been tracking with us uh, through this Easter season, we've been working through an Easter series called Eyewitness. Um, in a sense, every Christian since AD 33 uh, has been an eyewitness to the power of the first Good Friday. 
Uh, but for the past few weeks in this series, I have been attempting to focus on the original cast and especially some unassuming individuals uh, who saw firsthand uh, Jesus' life, his ministry as he walked through uh, that final week of his life especially and his death on the cross of Calvary. Um, and tonight, again on Sunday morning, I want to continue that series by turning our attention to uh, one of the most unexpected and yet uniquely selected by God individuals who saw firsthand the passion story of Jesus. And her name is Mary, and she was uh, from a little town on the western edge of the Sea of Galilee called Magdala, uh, and I want you to meet her. And so if you have a Bible with you, or the Bible app on your phone or whatnot, I would invite you to start with me in the Gospel of Luke and chapter 8. The Gospel of Luke and chapter 8. Mary Magdalene has been the recipient of some bad press over the years. Um, she has been wrongly, I think, associated with uh, the sinful woman of the previous chapter in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, uh, who washed Jesus' feet. There's no reason to connect the two individuals there. Now, she also, over the years, centuries really, has been uh, attached to some even more sinister legends that are nothing more than that and have no biblical warrant whatsoever. And so Mary's gotten, you know, some, some bad press over the years. But if you narrow what we know about Mary Magdalene to what the Bible says, uh, we see her on the, the events, around the events of uh, the end of that very first Passion Week at Good Friday, again on Easter morning. But then there's only one other place that you learn anything about Mary Magdalene. And that's right here in Luke chapter 8. And so I want to start with that. And I would invite you to follow along with me. Luke chapter 8, verse 1, it says this. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's, ho Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Now that passage is from the middle years of Jesus' ministry. He has called the 12, you know, his inner circle disciples, uh, he is traveling around the rim, especially of the Sea of Galilee, places like Capernaum, and performing miracles and teaching the scriptures. And, and as it says there in verse 1, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And in addition to those 12, obviously there was quite a, quite a crowd that was attracted to what Jesus was teaching and doing, but in addition to those 12, these verses single out a group of women that, that traveled to, that accompanied uh, Jesus and the other disciples to help support them and, and uh, provide for them out of their own means, it says there. And, and it's tucked into that, tucked into that little comment, uh, you find the introduction of Mary. And I want you to look close again. Notice what it says about her. It says there, some women had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, and one of those women in particular was Mary called Magdalene. And there's even a, a greater expansion of her description. It says, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. In the unseen spirit world, there is a, a constant conflict of forces. Uh, today, as Christians, we have the guarantee, the promise of the Holy Spirit constantly in us, indwelling us, and greater is he that is in us than, than any force that is in this world. Um, God himself is in us. Um, but even we, as believers in this church age with the Holy Spirit, we're still warned in verses like Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 that says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul makes it pretty clear there that, that there is an unseen spiritual world in which the enemy is at work all around us. And as Christ followers, we need to be aware uh, that uh, 
uh, there is a struggle going on and temptation and, and that battle sometimes with our own flesh is prodded, is pushed, is sometimes motivated and, and worked through uh, this unseen spiritual world. But we have this tremendous resource. We have the Holy Spirit. We have God in us. And so we have much less to fear. In Jesus' time, the ministry of the Holy Spirit was not as ever-present with believers as it is today. And so the role of demonic powers was uh, quite a bit more evident. Um, but demons stood no chance against Jesus. Jesus created the angels who eventually fell and, and chose to rebel, follow Satan, and become his demonic force. Uh, but Jesus always has had and had during his ministry here all power and all authority over them. And repeatedly you find that, you see that in the gospel accounts, uh, that Jesus would encounter someone who was influenced directly or controlled by some demonic force. And, and even the worst possible cases were no match uh, for the creator of the world. Jesus would just speak the word and the enemy had no choice but to flee. But that's something very interesting to learn about Mary's story. Um, it says there that she had been dominated by seven demons. Uh, scholars suggest that the number seven in the scriptures often refers to completion. Seven days, God had, six days God created, and that seven day it was complete, so he rested. And, and uh, other times that the word seven suggests that idea of completion. And so it might just be, you know, that, that was Luke's way of saying that Mary was just completely controlled. She was just completely dominated. She was completely imprisoned by Satan's forces. And then she met Jesus one day, and everything changed. Uh, she had been totally, totally set free. I made some notes, I don't know if you found them on YouVersion or on the church website, but I put a caption over Mary's resume that she had been delivered from the, the darkest past imaginable, the darkest past imaginable. Um, uh, I hope not, but somebody watching this might relate with that, might relate with Mary. Uh, you might feel like you have a dark past. Uh, maybe it's a secret that no one knows. Uh, maybe it's a struggle with a sin that has haunted you for years and years and years. Um, likely you did not attribute it to a demon, but maybe, maybe you have. I don't know. In any case, I want to give you some hope from this first introduction of Mary tonight. Um, if Mary could be set free by Jesus, then so can you. Uh, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what's been done to you. It doesn't matter the struggles that you've had in your life in the past or how dark it might feel. There is freedom available. There is transformation possible. And, and that's available through Jesus Christ. Um, I think about Mary and such a difficult past. And I realize that on one side, some might might sort of connect with her with that feeling of a dark past. I realize that others might look at Mary and think, wow, yeah, uh, she really did need some help. She really did need Jesus. Um, it's possible on this Good Friday night that, that some of us that, that look at her story and maybe think about Mary uh, come to the conclusion, yeah, she was an extreme case. I'm really glad I don't have that kind of a story. Really glad I'm not so bad. Um, the temptation, the danger, I would think, is that we might not, might not think that, that we have as much of a spiritual need as Mary did. Because maybe we grew up in a good family. Maybe we've walked the straight and narrow all of our lives. Maybe we've been pretty good people. Um, and there's a danger in there. There's a miscalculation in that. To think that because we've been good, we might not need God. Um, the scripture is really clear. Places like Romans chapter 3 verses 10 down through 12. That we're all that bad. Um, put the verses up here. It says real bluntly by Paul, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Uh, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now that, that seems to include all of us. 
I think this is just really, really important, gaining the most value from Good Friday and retelling the story of what Good Friday is all about and what happened that, that day so many years ago. It requires that we each see ourselves in Mary's uh, sandals, that we place ourselves in, in, in Mary's position, that we see ourselves in Romans chapter three, in the no one verses. We each needed deliverance from the darkest past imaginable because we all fall short. Uh, we all rebel against God. We all turn away. We all needed to be rescued. I love this old quote. Uh, years ago, a newspaper uh, posed the question in their opinion page in London, what's wrong with the world? And the Christian philosopher, G.K. Chesterton, wrote a very brief letter in response. In fact, it was just a one-line letter. It got published the next week uh, in, the, in the response section to that. But his one-line letter was to that question, what's wrong with the world? The answer, dear sirs, I am. Signed, sincerely, yours, G.K. Chesterton. Uh, that's true of all of us. I am what's wrong with this world. And that's the attitude of somebody who grasped his need and grasped why Jesus came. And it was also Mary's story. Uh, she had been delivered from the darkest past imaginable, but now she'd been saved by Jesus Christ. She had been rescued from all of that. And, and she had committed her life to follow him. And the next time that you see her uh, is on the night of Good Friday, on the, the event on the hill of Calvary. Um, all the disciples had fled. Only John returned to stand near Jesus as he suffered, as he died, being nailed to a Roman cross. But there again, the name shows up in the scriptures of Mary from Magdala. I want to read uh, John's record of that. And so again, if you've got a Bible, if you would turn with me to John chapter 19, I want to read it, several verses uh, of John's record of the crucifixion. And I want you to listen, listen for Mary's name. It starts in verse 16 is where we'll start reading. John chapter 19. It says this, Finally Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side, Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. The sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. That This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened, that the scripture might be fulfilled. It said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Verse 28, later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he'd received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It's impossible to really grasp the enormity of uh, that scene unfolding. You read a gospel account like this, written by an eyewitness, because John is that disciple that Jesus loved. Uh, it helps 
because John was right there. You know, John saw it himself, and this is his personal recollection, his personal perspective of that. But it's just so hard to step into that dramatic moment. Jesus, the Son of God, who had lived his entire life as a perfect man, was being executed. Uh, he was being, had been mercilessly, mercilessly abused. He had been beaten. He had been nailed to this cross of wood. Uh, pulling in details from all the other Gospels, uh, we learned that he was raised up on that cross at 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, that uh, uh, at noon, as he hung there between the earth and the sky, at noon, the sky went black. The sky went dark in the supernatural darkness that illustrated the rift in the Godhead uh, as the sin of the world was placed on placed on the shoulders and on the account of Jesus, the Son of God. But then at three o'clock, the exact same time uh, that just over the wall in the, in the city, the evening Passover lambs would begin to be slaughtered, uh, right at that moment, Jesus spoke his final words and said, it is finished. No longer would any of those Passover lambs be necessary. The sin penalty was finally, finally satisfied. The punishment for all the wrongs of people like me, like you. Uh, every person since Adam, that was all placed on Jesus. Uh, the infinite son of God in a human body. And he took the wrath of God. The wrath of God for our sin on himself and he finished it he finished it he finished all that needed to be finished for you and me to be forgiven and because of that salvation is now available uh, for anyone who will believe Jesus paid it all but remember as I read that um, that gospel uh, account written by John um, Mary was there. Mary stood by, watching it all. She stood next to Jesus' own mother, Mary. Uh, she heard him and trust uh, the care of his mom to John. And John would take care of Mary the rest of her life. Uh, Mary Ma Magdalene was this eyewitness to the brutality, to the suffering, to the immense agony that Jesus endured. And she stood near the cross on the darkest day in human history. Um, she watched. She watched as this one who had given her freedom, who had set her free from bondage in a terrible, terrible, horrific way. This one who had given her freedom from the darkest past, he endured the darkest present. Uh, and she likely did not understand why. She, like Peter and John and all the others, had assumed that Jesus, as the Messiah and the Son of God, could not possibly die. Now, what did all this mean? How could this have happened? Why did he allow himself to be killed? What had terribly gone wrong? She stood near the cross on the darkest day of history. And on that dark day, I don't think Mary understood uh, but one day, very soon, she would understand. She would understand that Jesus had to do what he did, that Jesus had to die. And I think it's important for us to understand that on Good Friday. Um, Jesus came here to die. He came to rescue us from sin. And, and that required God stepping into uh, our place through his own death. Um, every sin that Mary had committed, every sin you've committed... Uh, every big flaw, uh, every apparently minor infraction uh, of the moral standards of God, every one of those things requires just punishment. And God knew that man, either all of mankind, would spend forever paying for their own wrongs that they've accumulated over their lives in each of their personal stories, or he would have to step in as the infinite God and save us. And so, Jesus came here. Born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, 
uh, and then died in our place. The eternal God, if you can try and wrap your mind around this, the eternal God took our eternal punishment and he offers salvation and hope and eternal blessing to every person who put their faith in Jesus and what he did. Now Mary would one day understand that. But on this day, on this Good Friday, uh, she did not. She was an eyewitness. She stood near the cross and she watched him die. And she went one step further. Uh, my third caption was, she waited in a darkening cemetery as Jesus was laid in a garden tomb. She followed all the way to that tomb. Uh, Mark tells us this in Mark chapter 15 and verse 47. It's, he says, Joseph brought some linen, uh, bought some linen, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, placed it in a tomb, cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And here's the last line. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. She followed all the way to the cemetery, all the way to that, that place where Jesus' body was laid. Maybe she was in shock. Maybe she was the type of person just so committed to her rabbi that she was going to be there until the tomb was sealed and see it to the very end. We don't really know why, but Mary followed and Mary waited in the darkening cemetery as the sun set on Friday and she witnessed Jesus' dead body laid in a tomb. He was truly dead. There was no denying that. She could verify because she was an eyewitness. It's an interesting part of Mary's story. And it's only part one. And I hope that on Sunday morning, on Easter morning, that you will join us at 11 o'clock because we're going to pick up Mary's story for part two. Uh, she's a very significant individual uh, in this whole passion story, uh, the Good Friday, Easter morning uh, story about Jesus Christ. But if you narrow what we have read tonight to Mary, what, what did we learn? What does, how does Mary from Magdala add to our understanding of life of Jesus? I was thinking this through and kind of want to phrase this a certain way. Uh, the most unlikely witness, you know, this demon-possessed, formerly demon-possessed woman, uh, the most unlikely witness at the time would, if she was here tonight on this Good Friday, would tell us some things. Uh, some messages, some, some things that, that we ought to remember about what she saw. Uh, and here's the first one. I think she would want us to know. She would want to tell us that it doesn't matter how dark your past, Jesus can still save you. It doesn't matter. She, she experienced that. It doesn't matter how dark your past. It doesn't matter what you've done. That was definitely Mary's testimony. And, you know, I cannot fully imagine or even begin to imagine uh, the horror of her life before meeting Jesus, you know, and, and I don't want to minimize what anybody that's watching this has gone through in their lives, uh, experience over the years. But, you know, let's be honest, there's not a whole lot that compares with the depth of horror of being possessed by seven demons and what all of that meant to her for who knows how long. Um, Mary had this horrific, dark experience uh, in her past. But then she met Jesus Christ and everything changed. Uh, he rescued her from the darkness of demonic control and demonic power. And one day he would rescue her from the darkness of her own sin. Uh, she would say, uh, there's nothing so bad and nothing so dark and nothing that you've done or that's been done to you that can keep you from spiritual de deliverance through Jesus Christ. But you have to turn to him. And if there's some things, like I said, that if Mary could share with us tonight that we ought to remember on Good Friday, that's the first one. Doesn't matter how dark your past. Jesus can still save you. There's also this. I think she would add, and this is certainly fitting in our culture, uh, this as an eyewitness fact. Jesus did actually suffer and he did actually die. Um, any theory to the contrary is totally untenable because as Mary would say, I saw it happen. Uh, I saw it all. It can be popular among skeptics in our society, in our culture, to suggest really irrational theories that uh, Jesus might not have really died. He just swooned and, you know, came back 
uh, resuscitated later. Uh, it takes very little effort to uh, refute those types of foolish statements. The Romans were professional killers. Uh, no one left an execution, only partly injured. And what is more, Mary watched. She was there. Uh, she saw the spear pierce his side and the final drops of blood spill out. Uh, she knew that he was dead. She had watched his lifeless body placed in the tomb. There was no denying it. She saw it all. And so for those that might be skeptics and those that might want to buy into uh, some uh, ridiculous theory, I think Mary would say, look at the evidence. And I would say the same thing. I look at it closer. Don't just believe what people tell you. I look at the facts of the story and there really is no denying that Jesus died on Good Friday. But the final thing that she might say tonight is something that she came to understand later. And I word it this way. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, turns out it was. Salvation was fully accomplished and was available for Mary, for you, for me. Jesus paid for it all. He paid for my sin. He paid for your sin. He paid for Mary's sin. He paid for every bit of every wrong done by every person who has ever lived. And Jesus paid it all. And that is the good that came from this horrific day that we call Good Friday. But that good only changes your destiny if you do what Mary did. And you put your trust in Jesus Christ. And I think it's valuable to ask on a Good Friday message like this. Have you done that? Have you really engaged with who Jesus is, what happened at the cross outside of Jerusalem all those years ago, and that that happened so you could be forgiven of your past, of your sin, of what you owe because of that? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? If not, there's no better night to do that than tonight on Good Friday. We are all sinners. The Bible is so very clear. We all fall short. We all deserve to pay uh, through our own death and then through eternity apart from God following that. We all deserve to pay for our own sin. But Jesus, out of love, stepped in. Jesus took what you owe, what I owe, on himself. And he says, if you will just believe, you will not perish, but have eternal life. If you haven't done that, you can do that tonight. And I would encourage you, uh, just right now, stop and talk to God. And in prayer, admit your sin. Acknowledge that you do believe Jesus is God. And that he died on that cross for you. And ask. Ask for that gift of salvation to become yours. Um, If you've done that, if you look back at a point in your life and you would say, you know what, I do know that I put my trust in Jesus. I do know that, that I have been forgiven. And though I still trip and I still stumble, uh, I know that my relationship with God is certain. A Good Friday is a somber night. And for those of us that, that are Christ followers, that are Christians, we, we come back every year to Good Friday because it's an important but it's a somber night. It's a time to think about the price that was paid so I could have that. What Jesus did so I could be forgiven. Um, it is a deeply important moment to just pause and say thank you. And I would encourage you, um, if you know Christ as your Savior, to do that tonight. To really let it sink in of all Jesus went through, of all that he endured, of how much he suffered, not just the physical brutality of crucifixion, but the, uh, the spiritual weight of taking God's wrath for your sin on himself. Let that sink in and then say thank you. Um, express to God in the quietness of this night your gratitude for what he did to rescue you. Uh, this is a Good Friday unlike any that I have ever experienced in my years of ministry. Um, I read a poll this past week published by the Joshua Fund 
stated that 44% of Americans believe that the coronavirus is a wake-up call from God. It's interesting how many polls are coming out with that type of information. Now, I can't speak for God's intention through all of this that's happening, but I do hope that this deadly disease that has grabbed the attention of the entire world is a lever that causes people to turn to God, it is a wake-up call that people will turn to God and the hope that is available only in him. But I really hope something more than that. I, I hope that it is a lever that God uses to turn your heart if your heart is not turned towards him, that God uses this to turn your heart toward him. I don't know for each person that's watching this. Obviously, I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey. But I do know this. Jesus is the only one that can give you eternal hope. Jesus is the only one that can give you eternal hope. And that is solely because of what happened that first Good Friday. Jesus paid the price for your sin, for my sin, for Mary's sin. And he asks one response that we choose to believe. Mary was one who was there. She was an eyewitness. Her life had been totally transformed because of her faith in Jesus Christ. I want you to think this Good Friday, to realize this Good Friday, your life can be too. If you'll anchor your faith in Jesus this Good Friday, he will he will give you eternal hope. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Would you do that? Father God, I thank you so much for what Good Friday means. I thank you so much that uh, all those years ago, on the most important date in human history, the Son of God died to rescue people. And not just the generic people, he died to rescue Mary, John, and Peter, and me. That what happened on Good Friday, that, uh, that amazing, amazing interchange, a hill outside of Jerusalem, the sin of the world was placed on the Son of God. And salvation is now possible because Jesus paid it all. Lord, I don't know who's watching this tonight that might need to do something with that. There may be somebody uh, watching this right now uh, whose heart the Holy Spirit has tugged on with an awareness that, yes, they have a dark past too. And they have done nothing about it. I would pray that for that person, right now they would realize Jesus died for them too. It doesn't matter how dark. It doesn't matter how, um, how bleak the past seems and how, how much, how great the sin record feels. And Jesus paid for that. He died for that. And they can be saved if they will just come to you right now in prayer and admit their sin, acknowledge their need, turn from that and turn to Jesus and call out to you in prayer, acknowledging that Jesus is the Son of God, that they believe that, they believe he died on that cross for them and receive the gift of salvation he came to provide. I pray, I pray for that one would settle that right now. But Lord, I also pray for all of us that know Jesus as our Savior, that have the tremendous confidence of our relationship with you because of Jesus. I pray tonight would be a, a special moment for us to reflect deeply on what he did all those years ago, to see through the, the eyes of one who was there and to connect to our own souls, connected to our own heart, connected to our own awareness that what Jesus did, he didn't just do for Mary, he did for me. He did because of me. And that that would stir in us gratitude, but also tremendous hope. In a world in which it seems as though so many things have gone off the rails, we need hope. And the greatest of hope is found in Jesus. 
So I pray tonight that this Good Friday service would be something you use in all of our lives to turn our hearts in the right directions, maybe to salvation, but definitely to uh, gratitude for our, sa- for our Savior uh, and towards hope, towards confidence, that because Jesus paid it all, I can trust, I can rest with everything that's happening in the world, that you're at work, you're in control, and uh, you will bring your best through it. I love you, and we thank you. We thank you for Calvary. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we close our service right now, we're going to close with a song. I referenced the hymn, Jesus Paid It All, several times tonight through the message. And, and Curtis, Pastor Curtis and Annalise are going to come and lead that. And so I'd invite you uh, maybe sing right where you are. And these very, very special words. <laughs>